Good, e good evening. Good evening. This is the uh, subcommittee on nonprofit organization. Um, this meeting starting 5:30. If you could ask Mr. Clerk, please call the roll, please. Council Moon. Here. Council Rook. Here. Council Scott. Here. Be present. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I uh, also recognize uh, Councilor uh, Rita Mosius. Um, over there to my left, and Councilor Eric Kachia joining us. Uh, the reason we call this uh, subcommittee is this report on, non on the nonprofit and the partnership that we uh, have, uh, that you guys have with the city, um, uh, this committee and this council and this administration is uh, uh, really appreciated and, and want to strengthen that relationship. Uh, just want to check in with you and to see, you know, 
where you are, you know, coming out of the pandemic. I know that a number of you are uh, registered to speak. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let me turn to uh, my colleague on my right, uh, uh, Councilor Kim Scott, if she has anything to say. Go ahead. Um, no, I'm all set at this time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Scott and Councilor, Mo uh, Councilor uh, Rook. Thank you. Um, all right, Mr. Clerk, I know that a number of people are registered to speak. Yeah, it's Pre present here. Please call and, them. Yeah, in terms of just, um, it's open to the public um, counselor, so they can take whoever they want to go first on. And I just ask that they sign their name. There's, okay. no, you know, there's no need to register. It's just you open the meeting to the public. Thank, thank you, Mr. On Clerk. the subcommittees. Um, so any um, organization like to, uh, you know, step up and speak? As usual, Jim Wall. Yeah, uh, they they, they just, just um, put their name on that paper up there, yes. too. Yes, sure, uh, I already please, did. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 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 is this on? name down and your organization is on, Jim. The light is green. Is it on? Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm Jim Wild. I'm with the uh, Merrimack Valley Housing Partnership. And uh, let's see. The biggest challenge we uh, faced uh, during the pandemic was uh, conducting the home buyer training classes. You know, for many years, for 30 years, we've been doing the classes in person at Middlesex Community College. And so we uh, had to figure out how to reinvent ourselves. So it took us about a month to, um, to learn Zoom and to bring all of our guest speakers up to uh, speed. And uh, fortunately, we had uh, just upgraded all of our computers and software. So we were really ready technologically. Um, we had... Um, and that included the new software. We, we were able to have everybody register for our classes uh, through our website, you know, make payments through PayPal and all that stuff. So we were really ready for a virtual operation. And uh, we've had great success doing the home buyer training classes virtually. Uh, we had some surprises along the way. Even though the classes have traditionally been pretty big every year, we, have, we average about 700 families going through the courses. And uh, during 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021, we had closer to 1,000 families. So a lot of people were sitting home working remotely, deciding that it was time to become a homeowner. And, uh, and it was easier to do it uh, virtually because they didn't, you know, and we also appeal to a broader region of people too. Uh, and the classes have been so successful that the majority of the participants uh, uh, vote that we should continue offering the classes virtually. And so I've been polling all of the classes over the past year. You know, when the, when the pandemic is over, should we go back to in-person? And over 90% of all the recipients, all the participants have said, keep them virtual. And it works great because we do it about this time, uh, this time of day after work. And uh, people don't have to park, they don't have to drive, they don't have to worry about childcare, they don't have to worry about dinner, so we get to watch them on their living room tables, you know, we're having dinner while during class. But uh, so it's a lot easier for them. Another big surprise for us was uh, the level of participation in the classes. It turns out that a lot of people are really shy in in-person in in, in -person classes and you know, l less reluctant to ask questions, but as soon as we started doing the classes on Zoom, the chat box went wild. So we got millions of people who just feel really comfortable, you know, typing in questions. And so it's actually been really interactive and a lot of fun doing it that way. Um, it's easier in some ways and more difficult than others. It's easier because we don't have to set up classrooms and provide refreshments and all the printed materials. We've saved a ton of money on printing. Uh, but it's also more challenging because everything has got to be online and we a ton, ton of emailing. We're also doing uh, lots of individual financial and credit counseling by Zoom. Very few people actually come to the office. I worked alone in the office all during the pandemic and the rest of the staff worked remotely. Um, and so there's a lot of preparation for these counseling sessions. They're actually very efficient now because there's no, you know, I mean, we, you just get right to it at the, at the time. With a lot of advanced work running people's credit reports and getting all the financial data so that we can really analyze it. But, but it's been terrific. So we're, um, we're probably going to continue doing classes virtually. Uh, financially, we were able to receive a PPE grant in uh, 2020, which really helped us a lot. And, uh, and we've done really well. You know, we, and we, you know, we have a contract with the city using federal home funds for the, for the uh, down payment assistance program. We've been doing that for many years. And we also have a uh, block grant with the city of Lowell to co-produce the home buyer training classes in Kamai with CMAA. And so that's, that's basically our experience. It was, uh, 
it was, you know, took us a little while to adjust, but we, but we did, and it, it turns out that, you know, for what we do with educating first-time home buyers, you know, the virtual environment is, is really uh, helpful. So thank you very much for the city for this opportunity and for supporting us over the years. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Next. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for this time together. I'd like to re read a prepared statement. My name is Charlie Ott. I'm Director of Operations at Elliott Presbyterian Church. We run the day center there. Nancy and counselors, thank you for the invitation to attend tomorrow's community meeting. Uh, pastor is not able to be here tonight. At Elliott Church and Day Center, our experience during COVID has been twofold. As a congregation, we experienced the rapid shutdown in March 2020, followed by quick adaptations for hybrid worship and remote work. During those early days, when the building was vacant, we were victims of vandalism and burglary. Those struggles notwithstanding, the congregation adapted well, and our online church community thrived as much as possible given these circumstances. A federal paycheck protection loan turned grant prevented us from furloughing or laying off any staff. By mid-April 2020, however, Elliott property was perceived as a safe place for people experiencing homelessness to encamp, and we had about 12 people sleeping, eating, and defecating on the church property. At the same time, we were involved in advocacy efforts to open up new places for shelter due to the reduced capacity at the Lowell Transitional Living Center. In May 2020, Elliott began operating a daytime shelter funded in large part by the CARES Act dollars provided through the city of Lowell. At the date center, we experienced the typical struggles of, young orga of, a, young or <clears throat> excuse me, of a young organization, often building the plane while flying it, so to speak. We were grateful for the initial investment from the city of Lowell to staff the day center. Sustaining the day center has proved even more challenging as the COVID pandemic stretches far longer than any of us anticipated. Homelessness continues to be a pervasive issue in our city, particularly in the Middlesex, Appleton, Summer Street neighborhoods. We continue to hear that there is a need for daytime shelter where people can escape the elements use sanitary facilities, charge their phones, access Wi-Fi, and get a bite to eat. While Elliott has a building, it is necessary to hire staff and purchase supplies in order to run the program safely. In fiscal 21-22 and fiscal 22-23, Elliott applied for both CDBG and ESG funding from the city. In both cases, the application, award, and payment process has been unacceptably slow. At one point in 2021, I was worried we would not pay make payroll because reimbursements from the city of Lowell were so far behind. In 2022, we received some of our reimbursements more than four months in arrears. We entered the 22-23 fiscal year without announcements of the city grant awards for that same period. For a young, small organization like ours, this is simply unacceptable and jeopardizes our ability to carry out our mission. While there is not a single point of failure, we feel frustrated with the pace of the business at City Hall and the lack of creative solutions to move things along. The condition of Summer Street, South Common, and surrounding neighborhoods <clears throat> continues to be a point of concern. The city has already engaged with us in multiple ways to try and understand and alleviate the challenges. We are actively working with Parks and DPW for more cleanup of South Common. The Lowell Police Department have always responded quickly and appropriately when, when there are concerns about violence. At other times, however, the police have, asked, have been asked to relocate people from the South Common without giving them good options of where else to go. This creates a confusing relationship between us and the Lowell Police Department and puts the street officers in a difficult position too. The most pressing with the overriding view of mental health issues, the most pressing need for our clients is housing and substance abuse treatment. 
We have seen more than one of our neighbors enter into a recovery program only to be discharged back to the street after the program's completion, and it's no surprise then that they return to addictive behaviors. It is my hope that the City of Lowell will fill the vacant position for the Director of Homelessness Initiatives and offer broad support for that work and create a comprehensive plan for developing a more permanent, supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. And that said, housing will not carry requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. And that said, housing that will not carry requirements of sobriety. Efforts to remove this corner, Im efforts to improve this corner of our city must be inclusive of our neighbors experiencing homelessness and not push them to somewhere else. We continue to be grateful for our relationship with the city despite some difficulties and frustrations. We believe that our city is capable of developing innovative, inclusive solutions to even the most difficult challenges. Thank you for inviting the input of the community. And may God bless your work. Thank you, Charlie. Thank Charlie, uh, can you uh, submit that? Is that a, a letter from, I believe, a pastors of Elder Church? Yes, I will. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, just the next speaker, please. I just want to remind you, you have five minutes. This is not the only conversation we're gonna have, uh, but because the timing, we want to include everyone that's here and everyone that's on Zoom right now. So uh, please respect that time. Uh, we will have more discussion on this matter. Um, go ahead. Next person. Thank you. Good evening, members of council and friends. Just a little bit about six years ago, CTI took the African Community Center under the umbrella with addition to other nonprofit organizations that are assembled here this evening. The African Community Center is making slowly but gradually process. This summer, we were very privileged to partner with Harvard School of Design, whereas we are coming up with a welcoming guide that will help refugees and immigrants that come from the continent of Africa. We just moved to our new location at 99 Church Street here in the city of Lowell. But the space that we are acquiring is too small for the continent that it represents. We just had a company that have willing to donate computers to help our elderly. And we are on the process of partnering with you, Maslow, to have some sort of a computer literacy. As I just sat down, I just received a text from the company that are donating these computers. And they said, Gordon, the computers are all set, they are all cleaned. You need to pick them up. But tell me, we don't have the space to put these computers. And so we are appealing to the whole city that we need help. I just came from Jamaica just a couple of days ago, and I happened to be in a town that I just would like to see low as that particular town that I just came from in Jamaica. You see, people are willing to support and lift each other. And so tonight, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity, and we hope we will present more of these needs to you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Good evening, I'm Joe Hungler, uh, evening. executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, so COVID has um, 
had a huge impact on the kids we serve. I think that uh, anybody watching the news knows that it has a disproportionate income, I mean, uh, impact on folks that don't have means to do things like uh, better internet connection and um, those types of things. Our kids definitely are seeing much more of mental health challenges. Um, they have a lot harder time managing their emotions, uh, regulating their emotions and, and behaviors. And educationally, they all feel like they're really falling behind. Um, and the club supports that, and we have a lot of uh, programs that can help support that, but they definitely are feeling the effects of having had uh, a very choppy school life the last couple of years. So we're looking forward to having a hopefully more normal school year this year. Um, we have tried to manage that in a lot of ways. We have a mental health counselor on our team, um, but you know, one staff, one mental health counselor for currently we're serving about 150 kids um, and teens, maybe closer to 200 um, when you count the teens at night. Um, and we also have done a lot of programs. We do a lot of social emotional learning, a lot of trauma informed programming. Uh, those are things we had done a, a bit of prior to the pandemic, but are really doubling down on now. And we are trying to create more space because we know the need is bigger than it's ever been. I think that's one of the things that COVID really pushed was how big the need is in our community. You know, so we are um, working hard. Uh, hopefully by 2024, we'll be able to serve uh, more on the order of five or 600 kids a day um, after school, ages eight to 18. But uh, I do think that the biggest challenge we're seeing is kids' educational um, abilities the disparity in things like uh, internet and language access, as well as the mental health challenge. Those are really the things that we see as being major issues um, for our families. And the other thing that I think uh, a lot of organizations are feeling, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit is, it's really hard to hire right now. Wages are going up, and if we serve more kids, we get $30 a year per kid. That doesn't really help us with our wage challenge of trying to uh, compete with the market. We've got a ton of job openings right now, and um, we've given some raises, and we're trying to find a way to give more. But it's really hard to hire people, which means it's really hard to serve kids when you can't hire enough staff to make sure they're safe. And we're not gonna we're not gonna bring kids in to not have them be safe. So, thank you for the time. Appreciate you listening, and uh, we look forward to future partnership. Thank you, Joe. Unfortunately, we cannot help you with hiring. We encounter the same problem. <laughs> I'm well aware. Everybody I talk to is in the same place. But it's good to hear about your, uh, you know, expansion and all that, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> We're working hard at it. Um, anybody else? Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Livenia Frusa. I am the executive director of Dwelling House of Hope, located on 125 Mount Hope Street. Um, we are a food pantry, but we're not just only a food pantry. We do more than a food pantry. February 2020, when the pandemic hit, Dwelling House of Hope took it upon themselves to say we are not closing the pantry because of the need. We had to sacrifice to do so much and to make sure that those who were in need had food on the table. We started doing deliveries, 100 families every week started increasing. We thought it was a joke, but it was very scary what we were seeing. We didn't have a lot of help we had to do what we had to do to help those people who were in need. We continue to grow and continue to saving more people. Unfortunately, we've been trying to do what we have to do with the Lego we have. We're supposed to pick up food from Boston and other places. We need a big truck. We need a truck, refrigerated truck. We don't have. We can get food somewhere to go pick up, especially things like meat and other stuff. But because we don't have enough 
commercial fridges and even a refrigerated truck which can help us to get the stuff. It's, it's, it's very difficult for us. At the moment, we are feeding 6,000 plus families and we distribute more than 220,000 pounds of food every month. I thank God for Greater Lowell Health Alliance with the outreach workers they do have right now, which they are helping us with. And I know if they, that uh, program is going to end soon, and it, when that program ends, I don't know who's going to be able to be doing the work, reaching out to the community, talk about the COVID, and doing what they are doing. Our work is easy right now because of the outreach workers, which has been sponsored by the COVID money, which is out there in Greater Lowell Health Alliance, who are helping us. Thanks to Kerry for that. Every week we have a lot of um, outreach workers who comes to work to help out, but it's not a permanent program. It's going to end. And what are we going to do? I've come to a point of I'm not going to stress myself as one person. If the city doesn't see what we are doing, want to, don't want to help, we cannot do anything at all. Every month we held a COVID clinic with the support of uh, Greater Wealth Alliance, Lowell Community Health Center, and Department of Health and other nonprofit organizations who we work with. We do so much in the community, and I've been urging the city councilors to say, drive on a Saturday and just come and witness for yourselves, because sometimes it doesn't help for us just to talk when you don't see what's happening. So we need a truck. We also need commercial fridge and commercial stove to help us save some of the people who we give the food. You know, we have a lot of immigrants and refugees. We have been trying to help them to train to use the food we give them. But unfortunately, our kitchen is small, getting smaller, so we need help. And we have a building which is just sitting there. If the city can help us with the money to fix it, we can do more that we won't even be able to come here to beg for money. You know, in my country, we always say, if you keep on giving uh, a man fish and you don't teach them how to fish, they're not going to learn anything. So if you give us the money to fix that building we have right now, you won't see us here because we'll know how to make money, bringing income to support our city. I want and I urge the city councillors, everybody who have not been there yet, to take an initiative to come and see because it doesn't help for us to keep on talking. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Diego Leonardo. I'm the Executive Director of Line X Community Center for Empowerment. And one thing that I can tell you that the pandemic did for us was to show us how big the gap between services and the community is. One thing that we noticed is that their gap got exacerbated by the fact that there's no language services provided in the city, and let alone there's no connection between city and nonprofits. That really helped us launch different initiatives with other nonprofits that we can partner up and provide those services to the community. We were such a small organization just starting from 2019 where it was the initi uh, initiation of the organization. And then COVID hit, that really showed us that we need to work together. The only way we can really do things better is by organizing and creating a collective community. One thing that I really encourage you and my colleagues is to um, start sharing this network. I think this is one of the things that we really need to consider because some things that we like to do at LCC, we focus on education, but the education is really on knowing what the services are. We don't want to recreate the wheel and we want to get better responses in terms of services as well as what else can the community do for the city. One thing that we notice is that there's a lot of disengagement because there's no trust on the um, local election and local government and that's because there is no information that can get into the community. Sometimes you need to inform the community between what they see where so, uh, back home or um, how they were treated in the past just to understand how they're uh, able to 
engage with services. So LCC was able to provide a lot of services to especially Spanish speakers. And one thing that we were able to provide was that there was a bigger gap for Portuguese speaker communities. There was bigger Brazilian community that was on tackle until 2020 that's where all services starting to get translated and be more visibility to them. Now, I'm proudly to say that most of the services that are provided around the city do consider Spanish and Portuguese as part of the language, and that's due to the pandemic showing up the bigger gap that we have. So I really encourage to tell us what is the purpose of this meeting and what do you want to do from now on because I don't feel that this is just a thing that we need to do once. We need to continue informing what other organizations are doing and maybe there is collaboration that we can work together. One thing I know is that government has so much capacity to do things and then nonprofits come in to fill up the gaps that the government can do. So I think it should be a really good way to organize and collectively come with a plan that we can all come and coordinate together with funding, services, and possibilities for the community to be stronger in a way that we can do better things in Lowell. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Jennifer Sharkey, and I'm here with, um, I'm with House of Hope. We've been here 36 years, and I wanted to take a few minutes to fill you in on what's been happening in the past two years with COVID. And um, so we have 58 families every night, and we have um, who are in shelter and 39 families in supportive housing. So in the last year, so it was about 200, uh, about 225 families that we served uh, last year. And families were not moving out as much because of COVID. So the folks who were in shelter were in shelter for quite a while. I just wanted to, um, I guess, the key first, the most important thing is we never closed. We could never close up. We stayed open through the whole thing. And so it's been a difficult time to put together the policies and procedures so that we could be the best we could be for our families. And um, our host, we, one of the major things we've done is, would you believe, with cleaning, House of Hope employees fully embrace the deep cleaning and sanitization required to make a safe space. And we also incorporated social distancing and mask wearing at all times. In fact, only just July did the governor lift the, um, the requirement for us to have uh, masks. So we've been, um, it's been going on for quite a long time. Um, we shifted to, um, for, our eat, for eating at the shelter, we shifted to disposable plates, cups and cutlery, and we offered meals on a staggered basis so that we could have people socially distanced and eating and not, getting, not catching the virus. Um, all of these efforts and more have been effective. Um, we've had very few cases of COVID, um, none that required the um, ongoing hospitalization. We've had, um, we're very grateful for how things have worked out for us. Throughout the pandemic, we've encountered some illness um, among the employees and residents, and we were able to assist by a number of really important um, steps that we did. We reconfigured living spaces. Um, we, so we had families who were um, in quarantine, and they were separated from the uh, other families who were not in quarantine. We accessed motel rooms on a major basis. We coordinated all our time off benefits for employees so that we could help the employees while they were working to struggle, they were struggling with their own families and um, taking care of, of that as well as work. Uh, we increased the pay rates. We had an, a supplemental wage, which was very, 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 very excellent. Uh, we required employee vaccinations, and we did that across the board. We did lose just a few employees. Um, we hated to have that happen, but we had to have all of our employees vaccinated. There's just no way we could, we could serve our families well and not be vaccinated. Um, so we also um, have got a lot of personal protective equipment um, donated to us, and we also provide on-site testing as things got, uh, went on and got, we got a little bit more intelligent. Uh, about um, how to do that and how to do how to learn those things, so um, almost every day brought a new crisis and challenge. But um, we we worked hard to keep the family safe and also very importantly the children. Um, we we have a lending library of tablets and contain child friendly and educational media. 
um, for the tablets. Uh, we assembled toy and book bag giveaways. We configured working spaces when, if you are a child in your home and you have to work school at home, it's one thing, but to be in a shelter, only one, each family only has one room. And so it's very difficult for a child to actually do remote learning. And so we reconfigured learning spaces for the children. We bought desks. Um, we had um, a, a, a rearranging our, some of our employees to make sure that they could be there and s effectively serve the children so that they didn't get farther behind. Um, I've heard it, it's a, it is a big issue with the children, and, and it was just so important for us that we were able to do that. And we thrived and we actually, we really have, we really th thrived through all of it. It was very difficult um, getting direction, and, um, but we, our partners in the community and um, the city of Lowell was phenomenal in helping us with wh what we needed. And um, it's made a big difference. So we are finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we'll continue to do everything we are doing um, but we wanted to uh, let you know how things are, and we wanted to thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next. <coughs> Hello, my name is Todd Chen. I'm here for CMAA, Cambodian Mutual Assistant Association. The same thing, I just want to let you know what happened within the last two years and after the pandemic. Well, uh, CMA is predominantly served, um, uh, uh, our clientele is predominantly uh, Cambodian, but we serve everyone. Uh, before the pandemic, we opened the office uh, five days a week, just like any other office. But during the pandemic, we still open five days a week and uh, provide the same services. But what has happened during the pandemic, well, the pandemic changed uh, the way we do business, changed uh, our life, changed um, the way we uh, conduct uh, providing services. So we closed our office, but continue to provide services. But what has happened after the pandemic is we, we, we come to realize that there's more demand for services through uh, uh, CMA that we provide uh, wraparound service, basically the, uh, the one that increased drastically is wraparound service. So what kind of service that we provide? We provide services ranging from um, providing verbal translation all the way to filling our application uh, complicated issue that they need help with. So that service is, uh, uh, that part of service increased drastically up after the pandemic. Uh, why? There, there, there might be some uh, uh, part of the uh, issue that we are facing currently is that, okay, low wage employment uh, and the lack of uh, ability to understand the uh, English language, okay, uh, written uh, and uh, verbal and written, uh, also increase in the uh, affordable housing need. So because of all of those, the uh, rental price increased drastically. People need help. Right now, the demand for that wraparound service increased drastically. So uh, I'm not sure how we're going to help alleviate that uh, need, but uh, more funding definitely uh, uh, need to be looked at and uh, see if, don't know where to get it from, but uh, that is the issue that CMA is currently facing right now. Um, more demand for services, but we still have the same amount of staff. We still have the same amount of funding within the agency. So the delay in providing services, it used to be, like three days if you want to help, get the help filling the application. Now it's, it's continued to almost a week long. So I just want to point out that yes, there's issue with our agency. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Carl Howell from Community Teamwork. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share um, the, what our challenges and successes have been um, over the COVID period in the pandemic. Uh, community Teamwork, we provide services for over 54,000 people um, in the Merrimack Valley and the Commonwealth. Um, during the COVID <clears throat> uh, pandemic, uh, we've had to rap rapidly pivot as some of these other organizations have talked about, about uh, addressing schedules um, and how we support staff, clients, uh, and the, the people in the community. Um, 
really what it comes down to is we really see it under a th like three buckets. One is housing, uh, the other is childcare, and then uh, the third is, is food insecurity. That would have been really the large challenges in, in the city of Lowell that we've been um, challenged with addressing. Um, and then also just information. Uh, we had to set up uh, emergency hotlines to deal with uh, over uh, 300 calls and emails per day um, during the first year of the pandemic just to uh, provide proper information on how people can be safe and, and connect to uh, services that the city of Lowell offered with its health care, um, you know, and information around, around COVID resources. Uh, our resource center um, remained open throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, we supported over 600 households just with food insecurity and connected them to resources. Um, our residential staff, as you heard with the House of Hope, we had to remain open the whole time providing um, housing and, and shelter services to over 143 families in the city of Lowell uh, and making sure that they're they were safe and that they were um, also depopulated um, and uh, we did that through obviously having to staff appropriately and providing PPE but we also provided a lot of food resources so that families didn't have to go into the community to go grocery shopping and engage as much in the community to be potentially exposed so we uh, really rallied resources around providing meals um, to those families um, so that they didn't have to go out into the community as much uh, we also um, Regarding housing and assistance, over the pandemic, we provided 20 through, over $23 million in housing supports to owners and property managers in the city of Lowell alone um, to keep people housed or to um, get them housed from homelessness uh, or housing insecurities. Our uh, housing education and community, our housing consumer and education center also proce processed almost 11,000 applications for rental assistance during the pandemic. Uh, 11,000 individuals um, were also receiving uh, COVID funds to prevent um, homelessness and, and, and housing insecurity. We also uh, rose to the, to the challenge working with the city and other providers to provide homeless services. Um, we, working with Life Connections, we brought on 80 plus uh, emergency beds using hotels in Chelmsford, as well as uh, 20 beds at Life Connections at the sanctuary and uh, helping staff that and provide uh, wraparound supportive services that continue to this day. Um, <clears throat> where we provide over six, we have 69 family, uh, so families, individuals in the hotel in Chelmsford and, uh, and uh, we're doing a lot more outreach and r rapid rehousing services for uh, homeless individuals in the community. In addition to that, um, our child care providers, we had to shut down programming for about three months when the, uh, after March when the governor put in the emergency orders. <clears throat> but July 1st, we reopened to provide emergency child care services to essential workers like law enforcement, fire, uh, and medical staff in the community. Uh, and then that gradually allowed us to open up for our, uh, for our families that we do support to uh, allow them to return back to work um, so that their children had a, a safe space uh, to not only learn vir virtually, but also in a classroom. Uh, our youth service program on Dutton Street, that remained open throughout the whole program, uh, throughout the whole pandemic, where we served over 250 youth that were experiencing homelessness and rehousing, providing them with uh, food from our food uh, pantry, uh, where we served over 140 uh, home, uh, youth um, on a weekly basis. Uh, in addition to that, we also had uh, fuel assistance where we served more than 14,000 individuals um, keeping uh, their heat on uh, during the winter time uh, as well as uh, uh, air conditioned during the summer. And uh, our WIC program, uh, we experienced a 150% increase in calls to our WIC program um, to offer nutritional and formula services to mothers and children between the ages of zero and five. Uh, and we received a 200% increase in applications um, from the, from the pre-pandemic times. Regarding challenges moving forward, I echo a lot of what has already been shared, uh, but I do want to kind of say that a lot of these services that I just mentioned were provided with federal funding, which has now kind of either is, 
has exhausted or is going to exhaust very soon. Um, so those needs still exist. Uh, with the cost of info, inf, uh, with the cost of living have gone up. Uh, those that are on um, fixed incomes, like the elderly, those with disabled, their low-income families, uh, are still having a huge challenge meeting their house, basic uh, living needs, uh, and we're running out of resources to provide to them. Uh, provide to them, um, and uh, I think that's really all I have time for. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, we'll also send a, a written submission. Sure, well. that'd be great. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I'll take one more and then I'm going to ask Mr. Clerk to go to the people on Zoom. Uh, Hi, good evening. Thank you for having us. My name is Marcia Nampiu. I work at Lowell Community Health Center and uh, Jim Mali is here with me. So I was just, we, w we were just notified of this meeting today, so I don't have a written statement, but we can write it out later on if needed and send it to you. Uh, we are a comprehensive healthcare provider. The only thing we don't do is, admi is admissions. So we do have primary care from uh, child ch children all the way to old adults. Uh, we have uh, dental services, we have eye care services, we have the pharmacy, we have family uh, medicine, we have the Meta Health Center that serves primarily the Southeast Asian community and our new arrival uh, refugees and uh, uh, refugees and immigrants uh, from all areas. The health center did not close when COVID hit, but obviously we all changed how we operated, similar to what CTI is talking about. Uh, we had to rethink how we're going to provide healthcare to our patients and our community. Uh, one thing that I must mention is uh, just reiterate what Diego mentioned, that we would like to see how the city can integrate with the, uh, the uh, nonprofit community, because we have a lot to offer. I would urge for us to really think about how we can have an office here that is linking our community to the city so that we, can, we don't have to be coming here to talk about a few things, but we can have a, an ongoing conversation similar to the one we are having now, because we can't tell you everything in, in one sitting. So uh, Jim Ali will talk about some of the things we did around COVID, because she's the COVID master as far as what we did, uh, but I, um, we are happy to, to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank yes. you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jean Marie Gonzalez. I'm the Reach Lowell Program Director at uh, Lowell Community Health Center. So a lot of the things I did was oversee a lot of the community outreach when it came to COVID uh, as it relates to the health center. So early on in our community health department, we had to pivot very fast. We had to go into contact tracing where we were with um, our state and really calling our community members um, in regards to their COVID positive rates and then talking to them about resources that they needed, going out, delivering food and going out and getting them connected to the resources they needed while they were quarantining or isolating. So quickly then we had to come back to the health center, come back to reality and start our outreach. And that's when we quickly connected to Greater Little Health Alliance and a lot of our partners here um, to kind of start a, a Vax Equity um, committee where we really talked about how can we increase vaccine um, within uh, the Lowell community, especially with those populations that aren't really accessing them. So we were all having conversations with that very quickly in the beginning. Um, and so with that, like our outreach team was able to really increase uh, mobile vaccination within our community, use our um, social media to kind of share the word, um, share uh, when our outreach was happening. Um, and then also leaning on our community health workers who did have some language capabilities to be able to translate and interpret um, on site. Um, which, like Mercy was saying, is a really downfall during our um, vaccine clinics because if we weren't there, everyone spoke English and then, you know, our community members weren't able to access those vaccines. Um, we did com uh, community canvassing um, and leveraging our community partners to do that. And then right now, ongoing, we continue to sustain our partnership with um, Great Little Health Alliance, the Department of Public Health. Um, we have Dwelling House of Hope on board, HSPAN, really looking at COVID, making sure we have our uh, vaccine efforts out and, and that we're re continuing to do it because there's still a disparity. There's still people who need vaccines and we're not quite uh, out of this yet. Um, there's still work to be done. Um, and with that being said, you know, we are doing that, struggling within our own health center to figure out like, you know, we've got to make sure we take care of our staff members and our, and our health center. And also thinking about we need help in the community to be able to do the work um, that we um, are doing within our health center outside. So looking at providers for vaccines and providers for outreach, interpretation, and translation. And with all that, um, that's kind of all we have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. We thank you for all you, you've done. Uh, Mr. Clerk, could you call the... Um, Sh Sh Sherez Lopes. Sherez Lopes. Oh, she's on it. Karen Boyce. Frank Baskin. Hello. Uh, so my name is Frank Baskin, and uh, I'm a member of the Nonprofit Association of Greater Lowell. And um, I wanted to talk about how we can make better use of both our nonprofits in Lowell, which provide our, our needed services to folks out of a physical plant that's not used. Uh, we have a senior center that's open until three in the afternoon and then it closes up shop. And we have services, agencies that provides nonprofits that provide services to the community and need a, a place where they can provide services in the afternoon and evening and on weekends. Uh, and I think we should make use of it. We are paying for that building. In the summer, we have to cool it 24 hours a day. In the colder months, we have to heat it 24 hours a day. And whether anyone's in the building or not, we have to do that. And that's an expense for the city, and yet we're not making use of it. I think we can make better use of it and still provide services for older adults when we invite nonprofits to come in for a reasonable price. We would charge them something, but a reasonable price. And they could come in and provide their services in the afternoon and evening and, and on weekends. On weekends, the only space that's used is for food and the great room in the mornings. Second floor is not used at all. So my recommendation is that we consider, the city of Lowell consider how to make more effective use of the senior center by inviting nonprofits into uh, for a reasonable price uh, to provide their services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baskin. Look, next person. Yeah, there's no, the other two I called that didn't answer. All right, sir. That's it. Thank you. Anybody uh, here uh, like to speak next? Please come, come up. Hello, everybody. My name is Adriana Giraldo, and I'm the Student Services Coordinator at Avasi Adult Education Center. Good evening. Uh, at Adult Education Center, we not only offer English classes for adults, we connect the students with services in the community because many of them, they don't speak English. They just come to the country, and we quickly figured out that connecting the students with services in the community was a vital part of they become a citizens, become a members in the community. And when the pandemic came and we had to close the school, that was a shock. It was a shock for the teachers, for the administrators, and mostly for the students, because they were hoping to go back to school the following Monday, and it wasn't. Um, our first priority was uh, keeping in contact with them, making sure that they were okay, that they were uh, having the information that they need, and they were connected with the services. And uh, we did that through phone calls, texts, WhatsApp, um, emails. And we were able to uh, know what were the needs and helping them while we were all remote. Uh, at the same time, we were able to figure it out how to keep providing the English classes, knowing that we were facing a lot of ch challenges. English and digital literacy which are two really, really uh, big needs for the students. But we were able to, to make it possible. Many of the students were able to join the classes remote. And actually, uh, when we were able to go back in person, we have to keep the remote option because it was the best possibility for many of them to attend classes. But uh, definitely, digital lit literacy and working on um, uh, accessing the services is a really important key. 
Uh, thanks to the partnerships in the community, uh, we were able to provide many different services. We work closely with Lowell Community Health Center, with Greater Lowell Health Alliance, with the International Institute, and I think uh, that is uh, wonderful in Lowell, and that allow us to uh, definitely serve the community in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, Paul. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Gaudet. I represent the Merrimack Valley Project, which has chapters in Haverhill, Lawrence, and here in Lowell. Uh, we're not a direct service organization. We're a social justice advocacy group. And the pandemic affected us, like everyone else, about not being able to have in-person meetings. We've learned to organize the voices of people for change using Zoom and other methods of communication. Uh, we want to give a shout out to Lowell Healthcare Center. We worked with them uh, finding a site at St. Patrick's Church parking lot for reluctant, vaccine reluctant folks to get uh, vaccinated. And that was very successful. Uh, we've been working through these pandemic years with the, uh, introducing the Wheels of Hope program, which provides transportation for people who need treatment for substance use disorder. We've fought hard for the Work and Family Mobility Act, which in, has just recently passed this spring on making sure that everybody who's on Massachusetts roads has the right to earn a license through a driver's test and insured vehicles so that our roads are safer. I'd just like to suggest to the committee and to the council in general that the past mayor, John Leahy's program of having afternoon sessions where nonprofits could meet on Zoom together was very helpful. I think everybody in this room and in the audience values good communication of all the good work that's being done and with our civic leaders so that we can maximize good care and good change for our city. Um, this, is a, this hearing is part of that effort. Uh, I don't know how the council would like to organize that, but I think that that experiment of about eight weeks of nonprofits meeting on Zoom was very helpful for people to meet each other to hear all the good work that's being done and being able to support one another. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Maybe I'll just also remind you that uh, we are approaching the 6.30 uh, timing for the council. Um, so I'll take you for uh, next. I'll try to keep it brief. <clears throat> Nancy, thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Cohn, uh, Director of Lowell Alliance. Um, I'll speak really briefly about some of our work during the pandemic. Um, uh, so we partnered very early on with the mutual aid organization that also emerged at the beginning of the pandemic, LAMA, uh, to run a food pantry for six months. Um, and we also, we've been running a, a, a diaper bank for about 10 years now, and we sort of pivoted. Uh, we used to just provide diapers directly to agencies who would then provide them to the people that they work with, low-income families. Um, we developed a delivery service to bring them to people who are housebound. Um, and anyway, since that time, we have almost quadrupled the amount of diapers that we've, uh, that we used to distribute prior to the pandemic. So close to, I think it was a, close to 350,000 diapers just in the last 12 months. We probably won't be able to continue at that pace because funding, pandemic related funding is pretty much dried up. Anyway, that my purpose really, or why I wanted to get up and talk, was just to kind of emphasize or support some of the other things that other people have said, Mercy, Paul, and Diego in particular, about the importance of engaging the city government, engaging with the nonprofit community on a kind of a regular basis. Um, I think that would have been especially helpful during the height of the pandemic, not that it's completely gone away, but um, that is something that I think, you know, we all talked about a lot in the nonprofit community and did try to reach out. And there were, there were those fairly regular weekly meetings with uh, Mayor Leahy um, for a while. And we'd love to see a more regular sort of level of engagement or perhaps as Mercy suggested, even an office or a point person at City Hall to 
just stay in touch and communicate um, and coordinate with the nonprofit so uh, the city government has a good understanding of what's going on on the ground. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to, before I close this uh, council meeting, uh, subcommittee meeting, I want to see if Councilor, uh, uh, Councilor Kim, Scott, do you have anything to add to it? No, not at this time. Thank you, Councilor Rook. Um, Councilor Gachia, you have anything to say, sir? I just want to thank all the speakers for coming out and all the organizations for what you do for the city. I can remember years ago that we replaced the water line at the House of Hope and we had an opportunity to go in there because they needed more water so we replaced the water line up there and I was just a young kid working for the city and we went, when we went in there you see the people in need and you see the services and we can't thank you enough for what you do for our city. I think it's important that uh, we understand where the resources also come from so we heard about you know looking for a a truck that had a refrigerator on it. Mm -hmm. I think the place to look to is ask your state senator, ask your congresswoman if there's grants out there that can help you because that's the fastest route to these funds uh, versus what we do. And, and it's also the same thing with a lot of the uh, needs for computers. Maybe the school department has old computers that can help out in that area. So maybe you can reach out to the school department because, you know, they bought a lot more computers with the S uh, SR money and, and stuff like that. So I do th think that this discussion is helpful in a lot of ways. And, and I can't thank um, all of you for coming out. Uh, there's a majority that didn't even speak, and, and I think that says a lot about uh, people's character and their willingness to help a uh, city. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney, uh, Councilor Gachia, Councilor Mosia. Yes, you? thank you very much. I want to just take this opportunity where I see so many people that help other people to say thank you very much for coming out and doing what you do. Can you imagine a city with just the city government and a, and a limited budget and people needing help and we could not help them? That's where everybody here comes in through your respective organizations that give to people most in need. So I'm very grateful. And I know you probably never hear this enough. You probably aren't looking for accolades, but I want to give it to you to say, along with my colleagues, thank you very much for all you do for people most in need, because those could be our brothers, our sisters, our family members. Thank you so much for all that you do for everyone in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mosius. I too want to join you and all of my colleagues, including my committee members, as well as those who was not here to speak, that uh, we're here to work with all the nonprofit because you are a great partner, and that's what makes us as a city make us stronger and healthier. So I appreciate you uh, coming out tonight. Um, Mr. Clerk, could I have a roll call to motion to adjourn? Yes, here. Yes. 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 Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, everyone. the list.